alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin lost without hope with no place to begin your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains My orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to death When death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so free washes over me You have made me new, now life begins with you Release from my chains I I'm a prisoner no more My shame was a ransom me faithful to God He canceled my debt And he called me Rejoiced as though heaven had lost But then Jesus arose with our freedom
So if you will look in Matthew chapter 4, let's look at the last three verses in Matthew chapter 4. Sermon on the Mount starts in chapter 5, but chapter 4 will give you an idea of who's there. Verse 23 says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Syria, right? The country to the north. And they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and and torments. And those who were demon-possessed epileptics, paralytics, I almost said paralytics, uh, paralytics, and he healed them. Great multitudes followed him, right? He's got, this is the beginning of his ministry, and I want you to look at who's named here. Great multitudes followed him from Galilee. Now, the people from Galilee are going to most likely be who? They're most likely going to be Jews, right? So you've got the Jews from Galilee. And, but then it says, from the Decapolis. Remember when we were doing the miracles and we talked about Decapolis? Decapolis, Decapolis, the ten Decapolis cities, ten cities. These were Greek cities. So these are Gentiles. And so you've got this huge mixture, and it goes on to name Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. You've got a huge mixture of Jews and Gentiles here. So uh, this is a a wide spectrum that Jesus is addressing. But now I want to take you just a step farther. When he's addressing Jews, there's not just one kind of Jew. Right? There are four different types that are all represented all throughout the land of Israel. Uh, a couple of them you're probably familiar with. First one, the Pharisees. These were the religious leaders in the synagogues and at the temple. The Pharisees wanted to hold on to the past. They were known for thinking that you were right with God. God was pleased with you if you worshipped the way we have always worshipped. They wanted you to keep the traditions. They were very legalistic. You must do it this way and this way only. And even today when we go to Israel, you see evidence of the Pharisees even in Jerusalem and other places today. I've told you about the things that uh, on the Sabbath, right? They're elevators. You know, you're not supposed to do any work on the Sabbath. And so if you ride an elevator up or down more than two, more than one flight of stairs, that's considered work. And so it takes you a long time. You hope on, on Sabbath days that you're not on a, on a high floor, right? Because gonna, it's going to take you 30 minutes. But you're too high up to walk. You know, you're like me. You're doing Lamaze breathing by the third floor. And by the time that you get to yours, you think you're going to pass out. But they're so tied to tradition. But that's how they believe that you please God. That's the first group. Sadducees. Well, what do you know about the Sadducees? Theologically, they don't believe that there was a resurrection. And because of that, that's why they're... So sad, you see. Absolutely. You know exactly what I'm talking about. But the Sadducees were the liberals. They're the left wing. They said, you know what? The way Moses and the, and the forefathers worshipped is good. But we got to modernize our worship. We've got to interpret things through modern eyes and not through the eyes that are so old in the scriptures. Right? Third group is called the Essenes. Now, you've probably not heard a lot about them. In another religion, you could probably equate them to, to monks because they believed that the world was so sinful that you needed to be a recluse. 
You need to move away from the world. And they, you know, we visit a place where the Essenes lived. And boy, the, the protocol that they go through every day to make sure that there is no taint of sin in the environment where they live is unbelievable. Where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls was where the Essenes were. And so when we go and visit that, then we, get, we find the remains of an Essene village. And uh, so eye-opening. But they said, you please God by getting away from everybody. So you got the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes. And then there's a fourth group called the Zealots. And the Zealots were maybe a little bit what you kind of picture the word describing. They're real zealous. They're real radical. They say that you will please God if you participate in political revolution. We've got to overthrow this government run by the Romans. And so to please God, I've got to fight. I've got to take up arms. I've got to kill these stinking Romans and win our country country back. So when you say the Jews, what a conglomeration there. And each one of those groups thinks they're right. And each one of those groups have a different point of view on what they believe pleases God. Wow, can it get much more confusing than that? Yeah, and it's called America, right? Because isn't that pretty much how we are? We've got so many different views and so many different beliefs. And everybody's just, well, I don't believe any of that. I just believe this. Well, and you know what? You're allowed to believe what you want to. So it was, that's the environment. And then you mix in with that the Gentiles who didn't believe anything uh, about uh, Jehovah God, they may have come from uh, Syria where there was a foreign God or from the Decapolis where there were hundreds of Greek gods that were worshipped and these were the people gathered on that hillside that Jesus was going to speak to. How do you speak to an audience like that that is so mixed? Well, he did it in one of the most powerful teachings that he ever gave, all right? And here's the main point uh, of the whole Sermon on the Mount. Now, think about this. You, you with me? You, we're on a hillside. He's, he's obviously uphill, talking downhill, not down, talking up. And so here he is, and his main focus on the whole Sermon on the Mount is this. You ready? You're all wrong. Now, that doesn't get you a lot of popularity right there, would you imagine? You're all wrong because every one of you, Jew and Gentile, think that what you do on the outside makes you right with God and makes God happy with who you are and the life you're living. And he said it's not who you are on the outside at all. It's who you are on the inside. And then he goes on to explain that it's all about having a personal relationship with me. If you've never given your life to Christ, then or now or any time in between, then there's, it's, the whole Sermon on the Mount is meaningless. It doesn't make any sense to you. There's no way that you have any hope of living the Sermon on the Mount. And there's no way you have any hope of pleasing God. It's kind of a, it's a, it's a defeating message that there's nothing good inside of me and I have no hope. But at the same time, what a message of hope that my hope is in you. And my hope is in what you have come to do for me. There's nothing good inside of me. There's no way that I can be good enough for you to like what I can offer you. I've got nothing to offer you at all. But I am surrendering my life to you. Wow. That's pretty powerful and pretty radical when you stop and think about the environment that this is taught. Huh? 
So let's start in. We're just going to get to the very first. The, the Beatitudes begins with uh, nine statements. And these are the best known verses of the whole Sermon on the Mount. And we're going to focus uh, on these uh, in our study. But there's nine different times in these verses. They all start with the same word. And it's blessed. All right. And so this is telling you, and it gives you a series in each one, a series of promises and a series of blessings that are going to be true for the people who are truly committed to the Lord Jesus Christ, who truly are looking for their life to please God. Now, I want, we've talked about the audience that's listening to this now. Let me talk about the audience that's hearing this today. In our world today, we don't like to talk about this. We don't even like to think about this. We don't want to put ourselves in consideration of that. But most believers fall into this description. We're living our lives basically to be happy. You know that old phrase? I deserve to be what? Happy. And we make most of our choices, most of our decisions based on what I like, what I want, and what will, you know, what I can do for my family or whatever else. But we don't leave God out of it. We say this. Now this is what we're going to do. I just hope it pleases God. It's like a blind squirrel looking for an acorn, right? I, I just hope I run up and out of luck please God in some of these things because this is how I'm going to live my life, my family's life. These are our choices and decisions. But here, God's going to break it down. And there's three things. This one little verse, verse 1, Seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Look how it starts, seeing the multitudes, right? He didn't say he looked. It didn't say he glanced. Those are different words in the Greek, and we've translated them a lot of times different in English. But he said seeing them, seeing into them, like he's looking at them under a microscope. Jesus knew the needs of the people seated in front of him. Every one of them, kind of as a whole, but he knew every need in every person's life, especially the physical, the spiritual needs more than the physical, right? And he knew that they were empty inside, and he knew that they were hungry spiritually. And he said, man, my heart is breaking because look at the multitudes. Look at the countless thousands of people that are on this hillside listening to me. And when I show you a picture in a week or so of that hillside, of course it's changed in 2,000 years, but you can just picture, oh my, how many thousand could you get on this hill? Yeah. And so here's the deal. He was broken. He saw and he was broken because of the needs. And he went up onto a mountain and when he was seated, who came to him? The multitudes? No, there was a multitude of people there, but it was the disciples that came to him. Here's what I want you to understand. Jesus was speaking these words primarily to the twelve, right? But he spoke to the thousands. And he wanted them to listen. He wanted them to hear and understand what they could but he mostly wanted them to know that there was available to them this ability to please Almighty Jehovah God. But I'm focused on these 12 guys right here, and I am talking right to their heart. Man, I am getting up close and personal. We've been together now. We're living together. We're working together. We're serving together. And guys, I need to talk to your heart. And so that's what the Sermon on the Mount is, and especially beginning with these nine statements, the Beatitudes. Oh, I want to talk to your heart. So this morning, here's what I want you to do. I want to remind you, 
I need you to put everything in front of you down. I don't mean your Bible that you're holding. I'm talking about any kind of, any kind of barrier, any kind of shield. You know what? I'm here, but I'm not going to listen. You know what? Nobody's going to interfere with you. Nobody's going to approach you or come to you. I'm not going to ask you to do anything that would embarrass you. So I want you to trust me and just put your shield, put your defenses down, and allow the Holy Spirit, just to speak to your heart as we look at the Beatitudes. Can you do that today? Would you? You don't have to answer out loud, but that's just, uh, I want you to give God a chance just to examine your heart and life. Look at verse 2. He opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, if you just listen and if you just take that at face value, just what the blessed are the poor in spirit. Ah, oh, poor in spirit, poor. Hmm. You know, you really, it's hard to figure out exactly what he's saying. So I want to break this apart. I'm going to dissect this into three parts. And we're just going to take like a word or a phrase at a time, hopefully to make it easy for you to see what God is, uh, is approaching you with today. So this first piece and uh, I'm going to ask you a question with each one of these pieces just to kind of help you remember what we're studying, maybe to help you examine your own life. But let's just take that first word, blessed. All right? If you take, there's, there's a lot of different words in this language that he spoke that are translated uh, happy, right? Because that is one of the basic definitions of the word that he used was just a very general term of happy. Now, here's the way, if I say happy, here's what you think of. You think of external things. You think of happy or happiness. My happiness depends entirely on what happens, right? It's all circumstantial. If, if something really good happens uh, at your work and maybe they give you a bonus or a promotion, man, you get real happy over that, right? You're happy about what happens and whether it's family or friends or money or job or whatever it is, your, your circumstances determine your happiness. And I just want to let you know that if that's the only thing that's going to produce happiness in your life, you're in trouble because your circumstances are going to change from day to day. Not just day to day, but hour to hour. And sometimes what? Minute to minute. Yes. All right. Man, listen. But that, that's not the word that he used here. He didn't use that general term for happy he used a much more intense word and it's not external things it's internal things right remember the whole purpose of the sermon on the mount jesus is saying it's not what you do uh, externally but it's all about who you are on the inside you see this internal word is a word that only described God. How about that? No person is described as happy using this particular word. It's only Almighty God and the Lord Jesus Christ. How about that? Does that not kind of line up with our little phrase that we say so much? I want to be Jesus with skin on, right? And so if this is talking about internal, who I am on the inside, my character and my nature, and this is for a believer, my character and my nature should be the character of Almighty God. Because when we surrender our life to Him and He comes to live inside of us, right? Isn't it His goal for us to grow and to develop and to be more and more and more like Christ? Be Jesus with skin on? Yeah, so this whole deal of blessed is saying this is what God expects of every believer because this is a word that only describes 
him and he's saying, this is what I want in your lives. Does that make sense? You're connecting the dots, right? This isn't just, hey, I want you to be happy. No, God's much more concerned with your holiness than he is your happiness. All right. God did not die on the cross to make you a happy person the way we think of happiness. Right. He died on that cross so that we would have the ability and the availability to know him personally. And so that he can live inside of us and he can make us like himself. And so uh, this is uh, this is the whole key in understanding that word blessed. All right. And if you take that, you take the blessed and you get down to that little bit deeper, uh, more more, uh, internal definition, it means this, approved by God. When God looks at your life, He doesn't approve of you. Your life doesn't please Him based on what job you have. How much money you have. You know, what your kids have become. Your kids batting average. Uh, Nothing matters except His approval. And what is He approving? The people that are blessed. The people that are more and more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ on the inside. So when you look at your life, when you look at your life, here's the question that I want to ask you. And here's, here's part one to the outline is this. Number one, I'm going, to, I'm going to say it two different ways. What are you living for? Because I think if we would ever get really, really honest of what we're living for, I think it would open our spiritual eyes to what we're missing. Because I think the bulk of believers are living for physical external things rather than spiritual and internal things. We just hope that somewhere along the line, some of these external things that we're living for end up pleasing God. Oh, folks, what are you living for? What's the most important thing in your life? What is it that you're pushing and striving so hard to do? What is driving you day by day by day by day? What's the push for you? And you know what? If you want to rephrase that, you can change the what to who. Who are you living for? Are you really? It's real easy. You know, you ask that to a a, a group of believers, a group of mostly believers. Who are you living for this morning? And you know what answer you're going to get? Jesus. Well, that sounds great. But most of the time, that's not true. Because most of the time, we're living for us. We're living for ourselves and hoping that along the way, something happens to please God. Oh, this is huge, guys. Huge. Let's take that next phrase. So that's the word blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit. All right, now here, this is the main part of the verse. Let's don't miss this. So let's take this a phrase at a time. Let's talk about, because you've read this verse dozens of times, and you may have the wrong concept already in your mind. Let's talk about what it doesn't mean. Poor in spirit has nothing to do with your financial balance sheet. Has nothing to do with your bank account. Has nothing to do with your salary. Has nothing to do with what you've accumulated. Because all those things are what? They're external. And what have we said? He's talking about things that are internal. Poor in spirit. Doesn't uh, take into account your finances. It's not talking about. A lot of people think that means you've got a poor self-image. Absolutely not. Has nothing to do with that. Doesn't mean you're lazy. Doesn't mean you're lethargic. None of those things. Let's talk about poor. A lot of different words uh, in that Greek language are translated into our English word poor. One of them is a real general word for poor. And it describes somebody that doesn't have a lot of physical things. 
but they're working and they're making it, but just barely making it. But they're working as hard as they can. You know, I, the, the people that come to my mind are the people that we work with in Haiti. Oh, how I wish we could go back down there and I could take you down there. Those people work from sun up to sundown, and it is some kind of hot. And the average income is $100 a year for a family of six or eight or ten. You gripe when you go to the grocery store over how much it's gone up. Feed a family, clothe a family, live on $100 a year. But they work so hard. They're poor. They're poor. They're that general word for poor. But there are different levels. And there's another word that they use that the English translates poor, like in this case right here. But it means so much more, right? And uh, if you want to look this up, uh, P-T-O-K-I-S, K-A-S, Potokas. Patokas. Not that that means anything to you, but that means that, you know what? I'm a beggar. I've got nothing. I'm like one of these people with their backpack walking down the highway. I'm like one of these people that just push a shopping cart where they've gotten from some grocery store. I'm one of these people that you might find at the mission or under a bridge somewhere. I mean, these are people that are just absolutely, they have to beg for everything they have. They have zero, nothing whatsoever. That's the word that he's used here. Now, hang on to that. I'm a beggar, right? I've got nothing. I'm having to beg you to give me some money so that I can eat, so that I can, can sleep, or whatever the case may be. Let's add a phrase to that. Blessed are the what? The poor in spirit. Not talking about physical things. I'm talking about spiritual things. Now listen, this is where it's going to get deep. This is describing to us the person who is spiritually desperate. But I'm talking to people this morning that I would wager, you know, you're not supposed to say wager a bet. I would almost guarantee you that we know nothing about being desperate for anything. Matter of fact, we pride ourselves on what we have. And what we can do and where we can go. And how much, how blessed we are. But we're talking about external things. And God is saying that blessed, you're more like Christ. You're approved by God when spiritually we're, we realize how beggarly poor we are. How desperate I am. When spiritually we realize that we have nothing. This is describing, first of all, when we were lost, right? There's nothing in me that I have to give God that He would be pleased with. There's nothing in my life. There's, I have nothing to offer God. There is nothing of value in my spiritual life. I am empty. I'm not only empty, but I'm damned. Because I'm empty, I'm separated from God. And when I die, I'm going to spend an eternity in hell because I am empty on the inside. Doesn't matter how many times you've been in church. Doesn't matter what you've done externally. He's talking about internally. And internally, I'm empty. And churches all over our country have people in them that have a long history of, well, I've taught here, I've changed diapers here, I've done this, I've worked with students, I've done vacation Bible schools, I play an instrument, I can sing. You know, we talk about all that we've done in the church. And Jesus is saying, mm -mm, not to the Jews, not to the Gentiles, not to the church. It's who you are on the inside. Because until you surrender your life to Christ, 
God, I give you my life. God, would you come and live inside of me? God, would you forgive me of my sins? God, I'm so empty on the inside. Hadn't you felt that emptiness before? Do you remember? Do you remember when you tried all the things to give you that happiness, that external happiness, to give you that fulfillment and nothing would? And then you came to Christ. God, I need you. God, thank you for loving me. Thank you that you went to the cross to die for me. And God, I give you my life. Wow. All right, I realize and I'm aware of how empty I am on the inside. And that awareness makes me want Jesus so bad. Now, this is what he's telling a, a group of people that hear the exact opposite of this. The ones that come to synagogue to worship and the ones that are Gentiles that are in their pagan gods, they've never heard anything remotely close to this. And so all of a sudden, here's this mighty teacher that they've heard so much about that they've watched heal. And they're just, they're struck. Oh my goodness. I can't believe what I'm hearing. Yeah, this is what he's talking about. Oh See, here's what most people think today. What most believers. If I'm happy, if I'm happy, then God must be happy with me. If I'm financially blessed, then God must be approving of me. And could it be any opposite, any more opposite than that? It's not about my external happiness it's not about what I have it's all about me on the inside it's all about my surrender to him we talked that this was for a lost person how you have to be so you realize your emptiness you realize your sin and you come to God needing forgiveness but you know what this describes the heart and life and every one of these beatitudes will this describes the heart and the life of a believer, too. Let me ask you something. If you call yourself a believer, how desperate are you for the Lord right now? Oh, man, I prayed that prayer when I was eight years old in Bible school. Talk to me about right now. How desperate are you spiritually for God to do something in your life? Oh, you mean, do we come to church? Yeah, we come most every... No, I didn't ask you that. I'm talking about for God to speak to your heart, not in an audible voice, but in the depths of your heart as you read His Word, as you spend time praying. How desperate are you to hear from God? And you know what the truth is? Most of us aren't. Now, if God chooses to speak to me today, well, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll think about it. And I'll think about whether I want to obey him or not. I mean, obviously it's a choice. And that's how we live. And we think that God's pleased with us. We think that he approves of this. But in reality, we're so far off base. Unbelievable. All right, let's look at this. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of God. Let's look at that last phrase, theirs. Now, this doesn't mean anything to you. I'm going to just, uh, we got any English teachers in here? Are you really? Wow, I knew there was something different about you. All right. Okay, so nobody's going to like this, but, but can I just talk to you for a minute here? You're going to like this. This is an emphatic pronoun, and it means this. But when you translate the scriptures, you don't translate what it means. You just put the general meaning down there. And it generally means theirs, right? The people that are poor in spirit. But emphatic pronoun means that this is actually what it means. Theirs and theirs only is the kingdom of heaven. Theirs and theirs only. See... Heaven is not as, as everybody is going to be there as you think. It's more restrictive 
than you can imagine. Because Jesus is telling these people, everybody doesn't go. Theirs and theirs only is the kingdom of heaven. Unbelievable. Theirs and theirs only. Real quick, I'm a process guy. Let me give you four things. How do I know if I'm poor in spirit, right? Four things to check in your life. Number one, check your time alone with God every day, right? But I'm talking about you spending. I'm not talking about you, you praying while you're driving, you know? I drive next to a lot of you, and believe me, I pray while I'm driving that you don't do something stupid, right? But it's not, I'm, not, I'm talking about when you are all alone with God. Well, you just don't understand. You don't understand my job. You don't understand my family. You know what? You check your time alone with God. And if it's not there, don't blame it on schedule. Don't blame it on job. Don't blame it on family. Realize the truth. It's not there because it's not that important to you. Because if it was, you'd be alone with God every day. God, I just, I want to spend this time with you. Speak to my heart. Teach me, God. I just want to feed off of uh, your word today. How's your time alone with God? Look at that. That's an indicator. Number two, I want you to, to look at your schedule. And this kind of is the same thing, but it's a little different. My schedule is such. Have you ever noticed that... You know, when, when something extra is added to your schedule, like you got to go in early or you got to stay late or maybe you got to go out of town, you start thinking about the things that have to change in your daily routine. And I promise you that if you do have a daily time alone with God, probably if your schedule gets changed, you start taking things out of your schedule to adapt. It's one of the first things to go. One of the first things that goes is your time alone with God. How do I know if I am one of these that are poor in spirit? Well, I need to look at, 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 I need to look at uh, my time alone with God. I need to look at my schedule. I need to look at my prayer life, right? Probably if I'm not spending time alone with God, I probably don't have a prayer life that's anything more than surface things. You know, just... I mean, yeah, I know when you pray for a parking place in front of Krispy Kreme that that, is, that constitutes a prayer, but that's not real sincere and that's not, really, that's not really that important. Talk to me about your prayer life. And if you can, if you can understand that your prayer life reflects your level of desperateness, I think it'll open the eyes of some of our folks, right? How desperate do you pray for something? Lord, thank you for the day. Isn't it funny how we always start our prayers? Uh, you, you know, thank you for the day. Uh, and for many of us, that's as deep as it gets. What would it look like if you and I were desperate for God? You think it would be more than thank you for the day? Would it be more than could you get me a front row right up close to the door at Krispy Kreme? You know, would it be, would it be something more than give me, give me, I need this, I want this? How do you know if you're really poor in spirit? You can look at your prayer life. You can look at your time alone with God. You can look at... Um, uh, at your, uh, your schedule. Look in your attitude. Attitude's hard to see unless you understand John 15, 5 says this. Without me, you can do. Anybody know that verse? Nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. Show me your prayer life and I will show you how much you value serving God. Because so many believers try to serve God with no prayer life. God's not going to use a dirty vessel. Isn't it funny what an external religion we try to live rather than an internal 
relationship. God's looking at who you are on the inside. And until you surrender your life to Christ, you will never, never, never have the ability to please Him. Now let's pray together. Father, how I thank you today for this amazing study that we're beginning. God, I pray that you've spoken to our hearts. I pray that you've opened our eyes. God, I pray that, uh, Lord, you've, you've been able to challenge us, to enable us to see beyond our veneer on the outside and get a glimpse of who we are on the inside. Father, I pray for the believers that are so focused on external things. God, would you create in their heart a desperation to be everything that you want us to be on the inside. Father, I pray for the people who've never given their lives to you. They've never made that life-changing surrender of their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, how I pray that today would be the day that they would be so desperate that they would say, God, I want you to be my Savior. God, I want you to come and live in my life. God, I want to give my life to you. And I pray all over this auditorium, people are praying that right this very minute. Lord, we love you. God, we thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.